Welcome to today's panel on threats to academic freedom, the first in a series of panel discussions that the Center for Free Expression is going to be holding on threats to academic freedom. I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many First Nations, uh, Inuit, and Métis. I'd also like to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. My name is Jim Turk and I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression and I'm delighted to see you uh, for today's event. I would like also to thank our co-sponsor for today's panel and that's the Canadian Association of University Teachers. The topic today is ethnic religious nationalism and academic freedom. And in today's panel, um, we're going to be focusing on one particular case. Increasingly scholars of a country's history, politics, and culture uh, are challenged as anti-national or hostile to the dominant religion, ethnicity, or culture, uh, if they are seen to be critical or write critically or ask difficult questions uh, that uh, various interests in that particular society or country don't like. Uh, this has been a major issue for scholars of India. It's been a major issue for scholars of China. And uh, today's panel is going to look at the challenge faced by scholars of Israel and Palestine. When does critical dis uh, disagreement uh, become an attack on the ability of scholars to ask critical questions, to report their findings, or even to conduct their scholarly work? How can academic freedom, which is the foundation of scholarly work and the foundation of what universities do, how can academic freedom survive when scholars come under attack for, very, for the very uh, 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 reason of asking difficult questions or coming up with uh, findings uh, from their research? that uh, go contrary to the positions taken by countries or ethnic or religious or national groups. Uh, and finally, what can universities do to protect the integrity of scholarly work in such a deeply fraught environment? We have a wonderful panel today to discuss these questions, and I'd like to introduce them to you now. The first panelist is Mark Ayish. Mark is a professor of sociology at Mount Royal University. Mark's teaching and research interests include the study of violence, social and political theory, post-colonial theory, decolonial conceptions of space and time, social movements, as well as the history, culture, and politics of the Middle East, particularly of Palestine and Israel. Mark's most recent book is The Hermeneutics of Violence, published by the University of Toronto Press. Welcome, Mark. Thanks very much, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Our second panelist is Michael Link. Michael is an associate professor of law at Western University in London, Ontario. Michael teaches labor law, he teaches human rights, disability, constitutional administrative law. And from 2008 to 2011, he was associate dean of the faculty of law. Michael is also a highly respected, at least in my view, labor arbitrator. He has served as vice chair with the Ontario Public Service Grievance Board, and he has written an editor, co-editor, a number of pivotal books related to labor law. In 2015, Michael was named the mayor of London's, to the mayor of London's honor list for his work on humanitarian issues. In 2016, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Michael as the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Human Rights, for the human rights situation in the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much for having me, Jim. And our third panelist is Brenda Bandar. Brenda is an associate professor in the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. Brenda's research and teaching broadly lie in the fields of property studies and legal theory, spanning the disciplines of property law, critical theory, colonial legal history, and critical race feminism. She's the author of Colonial Lives of Property of Property, Law, Land, and Racial Regimes of Ownership, published by Duke University Press, and co-editor of Revolutionary Feminisms, Conversations on Collective Action and Radical Thought, 
Welcome, Brenna. Thanks, Jim. And the moderator for this panel is Penny Stewart. Penny is a professor emerita in, from the Department of Sociology at York University. Penny is um, also president of the Harry Crow Foundation, a charitable foundation that exists to promote academic freedom. She's the former president of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, and in my view, one of the leading experts in Canada on academic freedom. Welcome, Penny. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, the format for today's conversation with our panel is going to be, um, Penny is going to engage the panel in a discussion, in a conversation for about 45, 55 minutes. And then she's going to turn to the audience uh, to answer for the panel to have a chance to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. So if you're as you're listening to the um, conversation amongst our panelists, uh, if at any time a question arises in your mind, uh, just click on the Q&A button and write down the question. And when we come to that part of the uh, event today where we turn to the audience, uh, Penny will call on Ange Holmes, the coordinator of the center, to share the first question that was submitted and uh, the panel will answer that and then they'll go to the second and so forth. So please, uh, as you listen and have questions, write them down so that the panel can discuss them uh, in the last part of the panel uh, today. I think that's that's everything. Uh, over to you guys. Thanks, Jim. Um, before I turn to the panelists, um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about academic freedom and start us off there. Um, just in case some of you are not are not um, familiar with the concept. So academic freedom is a professional and an individual right accorded to post-secondary educators, university faculty, and some college faculty too. At the heart of academic freedom lies the freedom to conduct and disseminate a research, the freedom to teach without interference or censorship, the freedom called intramural freedom to criticize our employers, the administration, the institution and its policies. And, ex and finally, extramural freedom, um, the freedom to exercise a citizen's right to expression without fear of reprisal. And I might also just go back one step and part of intramural freedom is also the right to participate in what we call collegial governance of our institutions. Academic freedom does not require neutrality. Um, in fact, it, it, it exists to defend ideas that are often obnoxious, uh, difficult, challenging, uh, unwanted, uh, and, even, and even offensive to some. Academic freedom thrives um, thrives when it, we have the fullest expression, when we can really debate issues fully and, and totally. However, it withers and it can be attacked. It withers under censorship, under self-censorship, the real problem these days, self-censorship, under silencing, intimidation, harassment, disinvitation, all the ways we, we can shut down conversations. Uh, in Canada, the vast majority of our post-secondary institutions are unionized. Um, academic freedom is to be found in, in our collective agreements and disagreements over violations of academic freedom. Uh, and this may come up later in our conversation. Disagreements are handled through labor arbitration. And so that, that's in a nutshell, uh, a little bit on academic freedom. Panelists may have something to add. I may have overlooked something. But let me turn to them now. We've asked the panelists to begin by each each giving us a little nutshell of their own how their own work um, may have come up against threats to academic freedom, or how it engaged with academic freedom, or you know something something that they have personally uh, found in their in their own work. And so I'm going to ask. Uh, Mark, if you would start, please, and then Brenda next, and then Michael. Great. Thank you so much, Penny. I really appreciate that uh, introduction. 
Uh, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the uh, homelands uh, of the Nitsitapi, the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai, uh, the Iyahe Nakoda, and the Sutina uh, nations. Uh, Calgary is also home to Métis uh, Nation region number um, uh, three. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it really, the, 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 the threat to my personal academic freedom um, uh, uh, has been present throughout my career starting at, at the undergraduate level. It's not something that uh, I can't just give you one incident or one story. It's an ongoing structure of, of silencing and fear and erasure. Uh, that not just me, uh, particularly as an individual, but that all Palestinians have become accustomed to. Uh, and many other, of course, uh, scholars who uh, um, try to speak uh, uh, from the basis of the Palestinian experience of Zionism and the Israeli state. Um, and it, it, this, this kind of structure of erasure and censorship and intimidation uh, it's something that I grew up with. I, so I grew up under Israeli settler colonial domination for the first 14 years of my life before I immigrated here. It was not a surprise for me to discover that, you know, in a place like Canada that is a staunch ally of the Israeli state and the Israeli project, that there would be this kind of censorship and fear and silencing of the Palestinian experience uh, in academia as well. Um, and, and, and I would like to, you know, uh, it, it happens sometimes in very sort of mundane ways uh, things like, you know, advisors advising you not to write your thesis on Palestine. You know, how is that going to help you in your job market? Um, trying to strategize how to uh, uh, write a cover letter that doesn't sound threatening uh, uh, to, to, to people, employ, employers uh, and, and people on search committees that are uh, uh, going to be a little bit nervous about hiring the Palestinian person um, because of what that's going to bring in terms of uh, uh, the attention to their department or their faculty, um, getting advice by peer reviewers uh, on my book that, you know, maybe maybe you shouldn't get into Palestine so much. Maybe the book should be a little bit more theoretical uh, to start off your career. Um, so so it, it's just a constant, you know, hearing hearing words like, oh, it doesn't really, you know, so, you know, a quick example, you know, my dissertation at York, uh, 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 you know, was, was, was nominated to represent York as in the best dissertation of the country uh, thing, uh, uh, competition, but it wasn't given the best uh, uh, dissertation award at York itself. Um, and I remember at the time, some of my supervisors thought that, that was a little strange. Why would they send to the, na interna to the national competition what they wouldn't award as the best dissertation at York. <laughs> um, and they thought that was a little strange. And that's just a little example of many times where uh, uh, editors or faculty members or, or whatever will come to me and say, well, that, that was a little strange of a decision. I don't get why this happened and that happened. It wasn't the only time that this uh, uh, sort of thing has, has occurred. And um, usually I say when, when something strange like that happened, you just look at the, the topic and it's Palestine and that there's your, there's your explanation. Um, so so the, there is a, a, an overall climate of fear uh, uh, that is quite prevalent uh, uh, among faculty and students across Canadian campuses um, uh, that, that, that uh, um, uh, you know, uh, speak to this uh, threat to uh, people's academic freedom when it comes to the question of Palestine. And of course, I'll, I'll get into that more as we go on, but, but I'll stop it here for now. Thank you, Mark. Bren. Hi, yes. Um, so I, I, I want to say a couple of things before I um, relate my own most recent experience of, of this um, kind of censorship um, by saying that um, in speaking, I'm going to speak about my my hiring um, at at Allard Law Faculty at UBC, and um, I am quite nervous in talking about it because people are, um, you know, the 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 issue of confidentiality around hiring processes has really been used in this situation to. Um, stop people from talking about what's happened. Um, but I'm going to talk about my own experience of what happened. So um, this is, uh, yes, yeah, sort of direct experience of my hiring process. So I'll just say that to begin with. But you can see even from giving this 
uh, kind of caveat at the beginning should give you a little bit of a flavor of what the climate is like here at the moment. Um, so my, um, I, I was recommended for a post that I interviewed for nearly three years ago. So that's when all of this started. Um, so by the hiring committee, or I interviewed nearly three years ago, and then during the process, I was um, recommended for a job. Um, and the dean at the time decided not to offer me the position because uh, several individuals had objected to my hire on the basis of my support for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which I've been an active supporter of for a number of years. Um, and possibly, although I'm not quite sure, but my sense, and this is based on my experience on my interview day. So this is not based on any other uh, information that was related to me improperly or anything like that. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I do wonder whether my work on uh, Israel-Palestine and, and specifically my use of the settler colonial framework to analyze Israel was also uh, one of the bases that uh, these, these individuals uh, used as a basis upon which to object to my hire. Um, and then what followed after my interview day was a very contradictory and confusing process. Um, and, you know, I can go into the specifics of that, but I'm not sure how much they matter. Um, what became clear to me in discussion with my referees uh, was that my work on Israel-Palestine or my support for BDS or a combination thereof was uh, a problem. And it initially ended up with me receiving a, reje a, a one line rejection letter, um, which was then, uh, you know, again, as a part of this contradictory and confusing process, a couple of months later, maybe six weeks later, I then received an offer. And it became clear uh, from the turn from the wording of the offer that I received that UBC, not Allard Law Faculty, had decided to offer me a job. Um, now, after I joined the faculty, I'm then apprised of um, several other parts of this story, and so my initial, uh, in, you know. Um, conclusion that uh, as to why I initially received a rejection was confirmed. Um, and it was also clear that, you know, in, in, in terms of how this initial decision was reversed, that part is really black boxed uh, for me. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I do know that a group of faculty wrote a letter expressing their um, um, serious concerns with the process that had transpired and the initial decision to uh, not hire me uh, because it was discriminatory on the basis of political belief. And, uh, and this is the part that I want to focus on more in our conversation today. The fact that I'm a racialized woman scholar um, was intersecting with the academic freedom issue. And that creates a particular set of problems, right, and a particular particular kinds of discrimination, some of which Mark started to talk about as a Palestinian and as a Palestinian scholar. So I, I'd like to bring in the uh, phenomenon of anti-Palestinian racism into this conversation about academic freedom, because I think this is a really uh, crucial thing to put on the table to discuss. Um, in, in any case, I, I also had the support of Indigenous faculty um, who could see that a racialized woman scholar who is engaging in critical analysis of a settler colony is also, of course, relevant to Indigenous struggles here. Um, so a, an important part of the context in which this is happening is the fact that at UBC Law and now at Allard Law faculty, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but as far as I can tell, uh, there, there, there has never been a racialized woman scholar promoted to full professor in this law faculty. And I may be the first racialized woman scholar to be uh, appointed as a tenured associate professor. So someone who didn't come up from assistant. Now, um, I, I, as I said, that there, there are, have, haven't been any audits of any of this at, at the law faculty. So um, I don't have concrete data, but in terms of 
collective memory of the place that that seems to be the case. So, um, so this is all happening in a context where systemic forms of racism and gendered racism are is informing this this process. Now, um, you know, the other reason why I wanted to put this experience on the table is because we often think, when we think about academic freedom and we think about uh, how that's intersecting with, with well-ingrained forms of racism, um, we, we tend to look at the spectacular cases. Like we look at the Azarova affair, we think about Stephen Salada, and we look at where someone has been denied a job. But I think what is um, probably like perhaps even, or, or as common are these kinds of situations where you know someone for, for 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 really because of the very principled action of a group of um you know extremely astute courageous faculty that's the only reason why i'm here um you know where where they do manage to prevail now in these situations there the, the forms of discrimination and the forms of academic censorship tend to continue and that has certainly been my experience here, and which makes it even more important to open it up and to open it up for co collective conversation. Um, so there's there's a there's a lot more that you know I can say based based on this initial experience. But um, these uh, uh, you know my my experience I imagine is is very common. Um, you know we can this is sort of relating to what Mark talked about what about all of the cases where palestinian and other racialized faculty who support palestinian freedom and are critical of the state of israel are denied tenure but then appeal that denial and finally get tenure like there's all kinds of stress and discriminatory practices all kinds of different forms of labor that we are constantly expending just to you know be in our posts and to continue to do our teaching and research. And a lot of that is in, is kind of invisibilized when we are not dealing with the sort of spect more spectacular public cases where someone is unfairly denied a job or uh, is, is fired or those kinds of scenarios. So there's, uh, yeah, I just wanted to put some of these things on the table as a way of opening up the conversation. Michael. Thank you, Penny. Um, as Jim mentioned in his introduction, I'm a labor law scholar. Um, I um, was hired to do that. I, that's what I, I primarily teach and write in. Um, but in my background, I had worked for the UN in Jerusalem in the 1980s um, with respect to issues involving uh, Palestine. And that left a deep mark on me. And when I became an academic from switching from a, a labor lawyer to a labor law academic, and I was hired at the end of the 1990s by, by Western University's Faculty of Law, um, uh, my, a secondary a source of my academic uh, scholarship was on Palestine. And my work was entirely within um, international law, um, within uh, yeah, the body of UN resolutions. Uh, so I was what I was writing what I thought was very on controversial um, and well within the mainstream of of thinking with respect to international law principles. Um, so it turns out, I mean, the, the I suppose the story I will tell uh, to begin off with is my appointment as UN Special Rapporteur in 2016. By this time, I was I was obviously a, a tenured professor um, and the appointment had come a little bit out of the blue. I had applied for it. Um, in February of uh, 2016, I heard nothing, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, it was announced to my surprise, was I was not given any forewarning by the uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva that I was going to be appointed, and uh, immediately uh, the heavens fell. Um, Stéphane Dion, the then Foreign Minister of Canada, said in the House of Commons uh, that he, he's asking uh, the United Nations to reconsider the uh, the appointment of this uh, of this law professor because he's disturbed by things that he has written. Um, 
There were there were pointed questions and tweets that were put out by conservative opposition MPs, including Jason Kenney uh, and uh, Tony Clement. Um, and for a week or two, life was hell. And I was thinking, was this really worth it? Um, but the interesting thing is with respect to uh, the university uh, is that the university treated my appointment as, a, as an utter embarrassment. Um, there are approximately 55 special rapporteurs that are at any one time are holding mandates from the, uh, from the UN Human Rights Council. There are universal um, mandates uh, such as the uh, special rapporteur on food security, special rapporteur on torture, special rapporteur uh, on uh, on the right to housing and so on. And there's about a dozen who are special rapporteurs with specific geographic mandates, such as uh, special rapporteur on human rights in North Korea, Cambodia, um, Myanmar, Sudan, and uh, Palestine. Um, I am positive that if I was appointed to any one of the other 54 uh, UN special rapporteurships, I, my, I, I would be on the uh, alumni magazine for the uh, law school. Uh, there'd be a huge write-up. There'd be trumpets and uh, and drums being uh, being played with respect to this. Um, I, when I was being attacked uh, by the uh, by the law by the foreign minister and by conservative MPs, I. Uh, I asked, um, I, there was a stream of uh, media requests, so I asked to be able to use the university broadcast center to be able to, uh, to, uh, to deal, with, to have some of these interviews. That was refused. Um, your appointment, I was told, uh, as UN uh, Special Rapporteur, has nothing to do with your university appointment, and therefore the university is not going to do anything with respect to advising you, assisting you. Um, we're going to try to keep they didn't say the last part, but that we're going to try to keep as far away from you as uh, as uh, as possible. There was obviously my email uh, was uh, at the university was filling up with uh, with uh, vile messages, um, and it, it took pushing back. And the interesting thing was the same week that my appointment was announced, I was running the annual uh, human rights lecture series at the law school, and we had someone by the name of Beverly McLaughlin, the Chief Justice of Canada at that time. And I remember the end of the uh, um, of her lecture um, that I was hosting, um, uh, one of the corporate sponsors had said uh, that they had, they, re they reminded the audience that um, several months before uh, the um, Stephen Harper and Peter McKay, the Prime Minister and the uh, Attorney General had attacked her for trying to give the give advice that, that there's there, the appointment they were going to make to the Supreme Court might be uh, problematic and uh, it reminded the audience that the Canadian Bar Association and many, many lawyers came to her defense. And I, was, I had to remind the dean at that time um, that what's the, what's the difference here between uh, what happened to her and uh, what happened to me? And he said, well, it's not every day one of my faculty members gets attacked by the uh, foreign minister. Uh, so the the subsequent six years as my uh, my mandate as special rapporteur, um, I um, I was kept at a distance. Um, I was told at one point that I couldn't use the photocopy machine to be able to uh, produce um, reports coming from Amnesty or Human Rights Watch. That I was using both for my UN work, but also writing academically on as well. Uh, the labor lawyer in, inside of me said. There must be a good grievance here under the collective agreement, which I which I filed, and the university and the faculty uh, uh, then backed down uh, with respect to this. Um, mostly, I didn't have to push the issue thereafter. I was already tenured, um, but as I said, there was always this cold distance with respect to this. None of my work was acknowledged. I, you know, I was uh, I was speaking at universities. I was speaking at Harvard. I was speaking at Columbia. I was speaking in uh, at. Uh, old universities in, in, uh, uh, in Holland and in uh, Belgium uh, and in England. Um, and I was never offered or given a platform at my own university uh, with respect to being able to speak about Palestine or speak about my work as a UN Special Rapporteur. Um, this extended beyond the university. I had proposed a panel, for example, to the uh, Canadian uh, uh, International Law Association, which holds an, an annual meeting in, in, in late October of every year, I proposed a panel of where I had organized three other Canadian special rapporteurs and myself 
to want to speak uh, uh, to uh, the conference on our respective work as special rapporteurs. And I thought, boy, this would be a golden panel. You think how uh, how prized it would be uh, to have these four uh, legal academics, all of whom are special rapporteurs, all of whom are doing pathbreaking work on human rights uh, at various parts of the world. And the panel has refused. Um, and I'd asked for the reason why. And they said, oh, well, it didn't seem to have a coherent theme to it. And I can only imagine that it had to do that. Uh, uh, it had too coherent a theme uh, to it because one of, one of, one of us is going to speak with respect to uh, the issue of Palestine. Um, and this goes to the broader, I think, chill there is in this country. I, uh, in the six years that I was special rapporteur, I ended my mandate at the end of April. Um, I was regularly speaking to high level ambassadors or high level political decision makers in uh, in New York, in Geneva, in London, um, in uh, in Brussels, uh, as well as in the Middle East uh, and other places. Um, it was almost impossible to be able to speak to Canadian diplomats uh, with respect to this. And when I did, um, I heard back through a liberal MP that I know, you know the memos that were written with respect to what I had said was almost the complete opposite of what I had actually discussed uh, with them. So the chill, I think, is uh, is deep, it's long, um, and it's made a, uh, uh, it's it's left certainly in me a, a distaste with respect to the issue of what uh, Brina has spoken about, um, you know, where is courage? And it always struck me as odd is that, you know, I can't imagine a more secure position in the world than being a tenured professor. Where else would you be able to display uh, courage at work than if you had uh, had tenure at a at a university, uh, particularly with the protection of academic freedom, and I found that courage was in short supply uh, when it came to issues, particularly at my university. Well, there's a lot to go on. Does anyone want to take up an issue here? I, I just want to un underline that comment about courage. So, you know, I think that it is, um, it's, I think it's quite important to, for us to put a, put a few more things on the table in, in relationship to all of the tenured faculty who feel able to remain silent when these sorts of situations are unfolding in their own workplaces. And, when it comes to academic freedom, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, Penny, about the definition you gave at the beginning of our conversation, which was really useful and really helpful. And academic freedom is not only a professional and individual individual right in the sense that I think academic freedom is really only meaningful if we think about it. Well, not only meaningful, but it it is it is really crucial to understand that academic freedom, like many other rights, um, are a collective uh, issue, you know, that academic freedom has meaning in a community of scholars. And therefore it is really incumbent upon academics, particularly tenured faculty uh, to stand up for these principles. And, and it's important, I think, for people to recognize that when they choose not to, um, that they are complicit and perhaps contributing to the erosion of academic freedom. They are mm -hmm. contributing to these forms of censorship um, and they're creating an environment where one, certainly I can say this from my own position, feels a lot of pressure to self-censor. And I'm glad, really glad you mentioned self-censorship because that's something important to talk about. Um, and I guess just on the collective element of this, I think I was, I was rereading um, Judith Butler's book the other day, Parting, Parting the Ways mm -hmm. or Parting Ways, which is such a mm -hmm. great text, which was published 10 years ago, actually, I just realized, and it couldn't be more relevant now. Um, but she, or they argue in that book that um, in the face of this equation that any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, which is you know where where we are at in a lot of places spaces now, um, that to mute ourselves 
is to legitimate that position. You know, so, so we've reached a point where we're in a kind of impossible bind to speak out in these kinds of environments on Palestine attracts uh, a lot of um, censure, uh, hostility, and, and these kinds of reactions. But if we don't speak out, then we are in fact um, uh, legitimating the idea that to criticize Israel is anti-Semitic. So uh, I wanted to put, put those ideas on the table as well. And if I may just jump in here uh, um, and just put it a little bit more bluntly, if I may, uh, for tenured faculty who don't speak up on Palestine and who know better, because there's a lot that, that can legitimately say, I, you know, I wasn't aware of this or that issue. It's, it's fine. I'm not aware of every issue that's going on in the world, uh, you know, right? Like, so it's, it's fine. Like, I, I give leeway to that. But for those who have, who know the issue, and, and that's a lot, you know, I, I'm not talking about experts. People who just know enough about it and still don't do anything. Um, uh, I just don't respect that. Uh, uh, because to me, uh, uh, you know, what they, what, what people in that position for me are, are, are really uh, saying is that my status, there's no, there's no threat to their job security, but my status as someone who's going to invited to be invited to give a keynote or someone who's gonna be, you know, given this award, prestigious award, or whatever, you know, status-related thing that academics chase is somehow in their minds more important than the pursuit of justice. Like I don't, I don't relate to that. I'm sorry, I, I can't relate to that as, and I, I'm not gonna respect that. Like I'm not gonna say, oh yes, I get it. You know, you want to win that award, and that will mean this or that. Like, like that, I can't say that because it's it's to me the pursuit of not just justice but also justice and an honest pursuit of knowledge, which is a critical part of academic freedom. Um, the honest pursuit of knowledge uh, and and justice is is much more important than any status you're going to get from an association that's going to disappear the second you accept that award from everybody's minds. I'm sorry, but that that's usually how these things work. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we have to break through this whole uh, uh, fear barrier and, and this whole notion that if I speak up for Palestine or if I just, I'm not asking you to like speak up as be political, just speak the truth of Palestine. Um, uh, uh, you know, speak, speak in terms of, you know, uh, um, talking about the, the latest academic uh, uh, knowledge that we have gathered and, and cultivated and produced on Palestine. Uh, that if 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 if, they, if tenured profs can't do that, uh, then their tenure isn't worth anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just again, I have to be blunt about that, uh, um, uh, and I have to question whether they should have tenure to begin with. Honestly, um, uh, so you know, we do need to become, I think, more assertive here in in in. You know, I don't want to make Palestine the litmus test, uh, 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 but but if you're not standing up for academic freedom on this issue, then you don't stand for academic rights. I'll just go ahead and say that. If I can uh, throw in a, a slightly different issue uh, or aspect of, uh, of what we're talking about, um, and this has to do with uh, donor pressure. Um, uh, if, uh, let me quote uh, Barack Obama in his 2020 presidential memoirs. Uh, he's got a very interesting chapter on uh, written about his first term as uh, as president and and talking about um, the Middle East, and he said something to the effect of, um, uh, when there were uh, political pressures or tensions with Israel, he got um, a, an enormous domestic pushback in a way that never occurred when tensions or issues arose with any other ally such as Canada, France, Britain. Italy, Germany, and uh, and so on. And it's probably, I think, uh, the same way, mutatis mutandis, uh, to be able to say this with respect to um, university issues uh, involving Israel and, uh, and Palestine. Um, a year ago, a year and a half ago now, actually, I initiated a access to information request in Ontario uh, with respect to um, what the university had done in the period of time when I was uh, when I was appointed, 
Um, I'm still appealing some of the uh, issues with respect to documents that have been withheld, but documents that have been released to me uh, regarding this in, uh, show that there was almost immediate uh, phone calls and letters and discussions at the very highest levels of the university uh, from, uh, from the Israel lobby um, uh, asking the university to distance itself from me, to complain about uh, about my appointment, and to make it clear that uh, uh, that there might be uh, financial consequences that would flow from this, uh, should there um, uh, should the university not you know somehow embrace or support uh, or endorse uh, my uh, or celebrate my particular uh, appointment uh, with respect to this. Um, uh, it was uh, it was a revelation uh, to me, though it, 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 at the end of the day it wasn't surprising given the initial reaction I had from the university um, that uh, that it was clear that there were outside voices uh, who were making comments with respect to um, either issues of donation or uh, rupturing a, a a wonderful relationship uh, that, uh, that the lobby would have had uh, with the university, and I'm sure that was a major part. Uh, in their political thinking as to how to react uh, to my appointment and to distance itself uh, from what the UN had appointed me to. And I wonder what, uh, as we start to see this, the theme that you're all developing, I wonder what, um, I think both the external groups, but also uh, the, new, the new push to adopt um, the IHRR, AR definition of anti-Semitism, some of the discussion around that. And, and again, um, I wanted, we can bring in uh, many faculty associations opposed that, many people have opposed the definition over academic freedom concerns. But I wonder if the if you have anything to, to say around, around that as sort of structuring some of this exclusion and um, Maybe and I can... tying Palestinian thought, you know, Palestinian mm -hmm. scholarship to anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can start just by saying what, what we're talking about. It's the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance right. definition that uh, was issued several years ago. Um, and frankly speaking, I don't have a problem with the text itself uh, with respect to defining uh, anti-Semitism. It's the examples, I think, that caused uh, uh, people... Mm -hmm. uh, critical people, a great deal of concern. There are 11 examples given uh, in the definition um, to try to illustrate uh, uh, what, what, uh, what may consist of anti-Semitism. Seven of the 11 definitions uh, relate to Israel. Um, and it can, to my mind, both the definition itself or the examples given to illuminate the definition and the way it's been used subsequently has been used as a means of um, uh, of trying to silence issues that are critical of Israel or supportive of, uh, of Palestine. Um, uh, I can point to an example that people listening in today may or may not know from here in London, Ontario, is, is that there was a uh, uh, release by the, uh, by the local school board uh, of examples with respect to um, uh, uh, speech that would not be protected um, because it may contain incitement to violence uh, within uh, the public school system in London. And as an example, uh, they use the word, uh, the term free Palestine. If free Palestine was, uh, uh, is an incitement to violence, um, then you know that anti-Palestinian anti racism is alive and well. It appears that the school board, I want to hasten to add, has met with members of, uh, of the community and they've apologized for that and they've withdrawn that example. And they're now investigating how that example found its way into the, uh, uh, into the definition. Uh, but that I think that's, that comes from uh, the idea that is promoted by the uh, the IHRA definition that uh, that you can't criticize Israel without being suspected uh, of anti-Semitism or it smells like anti-Semitism or it, it's there's something foul uh, foul to it and that's that's important um, it's important to me that Kout um, has taken a strong position against it and many faculty associations have taken a strong position against that as well because it uh, I, I think I see it as a uh, as a deep curve into academic freedom uh, as well as promoting the idea that I uh, just just what saw a car accident outside sorry uh, <laughs> um, uh, that any kind of um, uh, uh, support given uh, for uh, for Palestinian rights 
uh, in the broader scheme of, uh, of human rights uh, universally uh, is something to be avoided. If I may just add to this here, uh, so this was, uh, I, found, I found out about this today, a coalition of IHRA proponents released a number of tweets that they called anti-Semitic and in violation of the IHRA. Here's, here's one example of a, of a quote-unquote anti-Semitic tweet from the legal scholar, uh, Palestinian legal scholar, Noura Arakat. As a settler colony, Israel has criminalized Palestinian life. You can go to jail for crossing the wrong street, driving on the wrong road, having a political thought, living with your family, farming on your land, doing nothing at all under administrative detention. Your crime is to exist. That, according to the IHRA, is anti-Semitic. I mean, we've entered the realm of the absurd here. I'm not going to hold back on that. The, 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 the examples in the IHRA are, are simply absurd. And as, as uh, uh, Michael pointed out, the definition itself is, is, I mean, nobody has issue with it, but I mean, it's useless. It's, it's, it's a, such a vague definition of anti-Semitism that actually would do nothing to fight against anti-Semitism. The whole point of the ITRA are the examples. That's, that's why the document was created. That's why there's a top, it, it was always a top-down process, right? It was states that got together and decided what this de definition would be. And it was uh, uh, states and big organizations and lo lobby groups that tried to get it implemented. And when they try to get it implemented at universities, they're not coming to uh, faculty unions, they're coming to university presidents. It's a very top-down process. And I was very much part of the campaign uh, against the adoption of the IHRA here in Canadian, uh, on Canadian campuses. Uh, and our approach was to go uh, for uh, faculty associations. That's our natural ally uh, in these fights because I personally have no faith whatsoever in senior administration on most issues, but certainly on this issue. Um, and, and, and faculty associations are where we need to take on this fight. Um, uh, uh, that the, the, there and, and, and university administrators, I'm not so concerned about convincing them. I just want them to know that we're here to push back. So don't even try <laughs> to bring this on us. Uh, so you just exercised your intramural academic freedom. One hundred percent, one hundred percent, which is which we all should cherish because that's a critical uh, on not just this issue, as you all know, <laughs> uh, but on a whole series of issues. I, I, and other members of this campaign were were very disappointed in some faculty associations that didn't respond to us, that were too nervous, or and again, this is where we get that tenured profs. That's who makes up most of these faculty association executive boards. And, and we were disappointed that some of them did not respond, but um, uh, they all voted unanimously on the, under the umbrella of CAUT, which we were all delighted to see and hear. Uh, and I think there is an important lesson here is that there is strength in numbers, that uh, perhaps it wasn't so much that these uh, uh, unions and associations that didn't wanna uh, pass a motion opposing the adoption of the IHRA on their own, they agreed with us that it was an attack on academic freedom, but perhaps we're afraid of that, you know, pushback and, and, and attack that they would experience. But under the umbrella of the CAUT, they felt uh, uh, comfortable to vote their conscience. Uh, but what I will urge everyone to do is to always vote your conscience, regardless of the consequences. Palestinians in Palestine are paying far bigger consequences than any tenured prof will ever pay in their entire lives. I, so I can't, you under, I hope you understand where I'm coming from, where I have no time for that, uh, uh, because you'll never pay the price that Palestinians pay. Um, in fact, most of the times you won't pay anything if you're tenured. Um, so, so the IHRA is, 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 is certainly an attack on academic freedom. I was put on canary mission for my public, uh, um, uh, 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 opposition to the IHRA. I wasn't on Canary Mission until I spoke up specifically against the IHRA. I mean, if that tweet from Noura is, is anti-Semitic, then certainly this, the very title of the panel is anti-Semitic that we're on here today, um, uh, which is absolutely ludicrous and absurd. Uh, but but that's, that is a serious threat to academic freedom, and it's not going away. We need to know that. CAT has given us a very important uh, motion. Uh, we should draw on it whenever it appears at your university. Please uh, draw on, on CAUT's uh, support to, 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 to push back against that. I'm going to ask us to turn, since I realize we're rapidly running out of time here, to turn to what should, what should we ask uh, post-secondary institutions and, and I would say our, our you know, unions, faculty associations, um, what, what should we ask them to do? And Mark, um, just before we get to that, 
uh, could you please just uh, tell tell the uh, tell the audience uh, what the Canary Mission is? Oh, it's it's a blacklisting website that started in the U.S., but it has a lot of Canadian scholars in it as well, and it's full of. Uh, it, 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 there's certainly a lot of Jewish scholars like Judith Butler. I mean, I, I was I was like, damn, I'm on the same list as Judith <laughs> Butler. This is pretty sweet. And and uh, uh, Nadia Bulhaj and uh, all of these people that are fantastic scholars. So I took it as a badge of honor. But it it does have it does have uh, uh, negative consequences. People, uh, um, uh, you know, the Israeli government will look at the Canary Mission site when people are visiting. Um, uh, uh, I know Palestine Legal in the U.S. I think are, are trying uh, some of the lawyers. Here might know this better, but they, I, think, I believe they're trying to take them to court on that uh, and trying to shut them down. Um, uh, you know, it has people when they Google your name, it really pops up right away. So it might dissuade people from inviting you to a talk or asking you to peer review something or, you know, uh, all of those sorts of things. But it is full of Jewish scholars and, and, and many racialized and, and women scholars as well, uh, um, and students and students as well. So, yeah. Um if I may just pop in, I wanted to come back to a couple of things. One, and, and I, I guess in terms of what, what we ought to be doing, I think we need to really recognize all of the different factors that are creating such a hostile environment for critical work on Israel, Palestine. So in terms of the donor issue that Michael raised, um, I think this is something we really need to, again, start talking about much more openly. At my law faculty, there was a gift accepted in 2021 um, to support the uh, exchange program with Hebrew University. Um, and as a part of the donation, I'm reading from the UBC Allard website. So this is all on the website. Uh, one of the uh, people in the family of the donors stated, and I'm quoting, people need to learn what an amazing place Israel is with anti-Israel rhetoric and anti-Semitism on the rise, a positive academic exchange is an excellent way to alter perceptions and educate students. Cross-cultural exchanges are such an important thing to do, end quote. So we can see how when a university uh, faculty or a faculty of law decides to accept a gift, uh, a large donation, um, with the understanding that the money is being given to counter quote unquote anti-Israel rhetoric, which we can see with the IHR definition includes criticism of Israel, right? Um, that this is a, a creating an environment where uh, upholding basic principles of academic freedom is completely in jeopardy. Now, apropos of the IHRA definition, actually, as we're having this seminar, there's a motion in front of the Vancouver City Council. There were recent elections and there was a center right sweep, unfortunately, of the um, council. And they are debating right now whether to adopt um, a motion that would um, you know, uh, accept the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. So you know, that, that's happening. <laughs> Um, I agree that the, the faculty associations are the place to start uh, organizing around this and, and, and to add to that, I think a part of our academic freedom, but also our anti-racism and our anti-Palestinian racism activism uh, needs to be uh, just simply having more discussions on campus. The, the level of fear, to go back to Mark's points, is profound. There is such a fear of having academic seminars related to Palestine, to teaching Palestine in the classroom, to talking about BDS. I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, even getting to the point where you want to put a motion of support forward for BDS, uh, you know, uh, addressing people's concerns about anti-Semitism. We, we are constantly distracted by what's happening in Palestine. We're, we're also distracted from the rise of actual anti-Semitism, I would say, uh, here and, and in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think we, we, we need to, and given this is such a, a, um, an acute issue, I, I do think that tenured faculty who may not be researching Palestine need to recognize that this is a, you know, at the moment, it is a litmus test of 
of whether a place upholds academic freedom and whether they support basic principles of anti-colonialism and anti-racism. Uh, you know, and so I, I, I think um, we, we, we need to organize and I, I or keep organizing, obviously. And, and I, I also think that um, there's just going to be a lot of continuing harassment of scholars who do this kind of work. And I, I don't think, I can't see um, any way around that actually, but you know, the, the only way to deal with that form of harassment is to, is to do things collectively. I really, I really believe that. Yeah, and, and if I may just add, you know, we always hear this line from university admin, senior admin that they don't take positions on these political issues and that's why they don't wanna to touch it or talk about it. Meanwhile, they're going on a junket to Israel organized by Sija in August. That, that's not being neutral. <laughs> when you go on a junket by Sija to Israel to create in, uh, relationships with Israeli institutions, uh, you're, not, you're not taking a neutral position. In what world is that neutral? Uh, you're going there to, uh, on a trip organized by a lobby group. Um, uh, so, you know, universities are, 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 are dis especially senior administrators, are disingenuous, sorry, disingenuous in, in a lot of their talking points on this issue. And what the, the only time that the, oh, we, we, we just don't want, there's a safety issue or a security issue or something, the only time that that comes up is when there's a, 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 an event that is going to speak about uh, Palestinian experiences and critiques of Zionism in Israel. Uh, those are the those are the talks they don't want anything to do with, but they're completely comfortable with going with a group like Sija, who has we know has interfered in academic affairs in in the Azarava case and, and others. I'm sure um, they're, they're happy to go on trips organized by by, by such lobby groups. So so that's where we are. Uh, let's you know we have to call a spade a spade here. That's where we are. Canadian universities are clearly on on this Canadian government side, which is on. The, the Israeli side of, the, of, of this issue. So Brenna, you had mentioned at one point, you had talked about uh, intersections and racialized women. And I'm wondering if there's any organizing across campuses, within campuses, across groups um, that may be happening or maybe a way to, way to also start to address things. You know, I, I agree with you. I think that, that organizing is really key here. I think that, you know, the the, the conversation around anti-Palestinian racism is really important and also really interesting from an anti-racist perspective. So the, the idea and the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association brought out a very good report recently um, detail, defining what anti-Palestinian racism is and um, exploring many different examples of how that is present in Canada. And so anti-Palestinian racism, of course, you know, and, and none of us can fully understand the experiences of Palestinians, I just want to say that, who are, who are non-Palestinian. So recognizing that very profound and important difference. Um, so, but, but the idea of anti-Palestinian racism is, is that this form of racism that is foremostly, I guess, directed towards Palestinians is also directed at people who are not Palestinian um, often these are um, differently racialized scholars who hold a particular political position on Israel-Palestine. So it's a form of racism that um, attaches to political belief rather than just ethno-racial or ethno-religious um, identity. And, you know, in that way, I think... <laughs> organizing um, against anti-Palestinian racism means that there's the potential to build really meaningful coalitions and solidarity around this form of racism, because it is not something that is only affecting uh, you know, one particular group of people. It is something that is affecting um, many different people on the basis of their political views. So, um, you know, obviously there are other historical examples of where we can see that, you know, um, different forms of racism attached to people involved in freedom struggles with other uh, racialized groups. Um, but this is another example of that. So, um, you know, I think 
what, what I've experienced in Canada, and I was in the UK for a long time before moving back recently, and I, I think the level of uh, fear and wanting to um, avoid anyone who is marked as being in support of Palestinian freedom or critical of Israel is very profound on Canadian university campuses. So I find that there is less organizing around these particular issues here. Um, you know, people are so afraid of retaliation. They're so afraid of loss of opportunity. They're so afraid of controversy that they stay away from doing that kind of organizing. That, that's been my experience so far. Thank you. I think um, I should start to take some questions. Um, and uh, we're at three o'clock now, so uh, we'll turn, Ange, if we could have the first question. Uh, yeah, the first question, uh, an attendee asks, given these important topics, I'm curious to hear about your thoughts on the rise of anti-Semitism, specifically on university campuses, perhaps aiding to the fear of putting Palestinian issues on a pedestal. And I do want to remind the audience uh, that they can use the Q&A button to ask questions now. Is, sorry, this is this is obviously a leading question here because uh, the the whole uh, uh, claim behind this is that a BDS sticker is an anti-Semitic incident, uh, which is an absolutely absurd statement. Um, uh, so, so uh, of course, let's just be very clear: anti-Semitism is very real. It is a real threat. Uh, it, it is on the rise in right-wing uh, uh, politics, uh, uh, both in Canada, the U.S., and and across Europe. Um, and, and it should be tackled and, and uh, named and opposed and exposed wherever it appears. Uh, but the conflation of anti-Semitism with Palestinian resistance and struggle for liberation and freedom and human rights is, 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 a, is a, 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 a strategy devised by the Israeli state since the 1960s and 1970s uh, to silence and erase and, and erase uh, Palestinian uh, uh, paradigms like settler colonialism and, and uh, 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 explanatory paradigms that show the racist foundations of the Israeli state. Um, so, so you can't conflate the two. Uh, uh, speaking about Palestine has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Free Palestine has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. And we have to be very, very clear about that. So, so, so that's my answer to that question, which is, which is uh, you know, uh, sorry, but uh, fallacious in its very premise. Anyone else want to comment or will we move on? Uh, I, I'd like to comment, but maybe Michael would like to come in. No, please go ahead. I'm, I was going to pass on this question because I thought Mark did a, gave a good answer and I'm looking forward to your answer. Well, um, if this isn't too, I mean, this is a very specific particular answer based on some of my experiences of teaching here in the last um, year and a half or so. So I wouldn't want to generalize on the basis of my experience here. But I'll go ahead just because it's a little bit hopeful actually. I have had some Jewish students uh, in the courses that I teach really want to explore. So just teach, I'm just speaking academically now and in terms of study, um, they wanted to explore histories of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust um, in relationship to um, other, colon other colonial histories. Um, you know, before even getting to Israel-Palestine, right? So, you know, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a lot that we could talk about. There's a lot that we could study if we could only start from the point that, you know, Mark mentioned, which is that we start, our point of departure is that being critical of Israel and thinking about Israel as a, as a settler colonial formation, um, or talking about apartheid practices of the Israeli state is not in and of itself anti-Semitic. And if we can, you know, the students who I'm referring to, I think do have that premise. They do have that point of departure. So when we start at that point, we allow ourselves to have a really interesting and much broader conversation about histories of anti-Semitism, about contemporary forms of anti-Semitism, et cetera. Um, but the, the, the climate of censorship 
And that equation, criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, shuts down really important conversations. And it shuts down the space that we actually really need to talk across difference. You know, I mean, we can't even have a conversation, uh, you know, <laughs> about uh, the different positions people take in relationship to something like BDS. So uh, I think we're at a very, very bad point. And, you know, we really need to have the courage and more faculty need to have the courage to have these conversations. Thank you. Ange, next question, please. Uh, yeah, the next question uh, is from Daniel, uh, and uh, this is for you, Michael. Um, Daniel asks, how do you justify the Human Rights Commission headed by so many countries such as People's Republic of China, Zimbabwe, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, and the past memberships of Algeria, Syria, Libya, Uganda, etc., who are more egregious in human rights abuses, including torture, extrajudicial killings, etc.? Sure, happy to answer that. Um, first of all, it's not the Human Rights Commission, it's the Human Rights Council. Um, second of all, I'm not aware in terms of being president of the council that uh, the uh, PRC, the uh, Zim Zimbabwe, Russia, Saudi Arabia, or Pakistan were ever uh, uh, presidents of the uh, Human Rights Council. When I was there, uh, it, the presidents were from South Korea, than Argentina and Fiji. Um, yes, there may have been memberships of some of these countries on there, but um, uh, what, I, what I, I guess the problem I often get thrown back, which I think is at the heart of this question, is this whataboutism. Um, what we can't talk about Israel because there's already always going to be a more egregious example of human rights violations, and there are other uh, as egregious or more egregious uh, examples of human rights violations in the world, but it doesn't mean that the Human Rights Council um, or uh, countries that have been, or organizations that have been critical of Israel, such as Human Rights Watch or Amnesty, are not also uh, broadening their scope to include human rights violations right around the world. I told when I when I was introduced, I said that I was a, the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights Violations in Palestine and the Palestinian uh, territories, I was one of 12 uh, regional or country specific um, special rapporteurs. There was a special rapporteur with respect to human rights violations in North Korea, in Cambodia, in Belarus, in Myanmar, in Sudan. Uh, there had been one for Haiti, there had been one for Cote d'Ivoire, uh, as well as a number of other countries uh, as well, including Eritrea that comes to mind. So it isn't as if the, uh, the only focus or even the main focus of, uh, of the Human Rights Council uh, is on Israel. Um, and I suppose the other thing I have to say is the human rights violations that go on uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory are egregious. Uh, they are widespread. They are have been regularly criticized uh, by the United Nations. And the last thing I'll say is the United Nations has a special um, responsibility for Israel and Palestine. It was the United Nations in 1947-48 that gave the birth certificate to, uh, to Israel. Uh, the, the United Nations General Assembly today uh, has passed uh, regular resolutions which says that it, the United Nations, bears a permanent responsibility for ensuring the settlement of the question of Palestine in a just and fair way, um, and will keep that responsibility until there is such a settlement. So. Uh, it should come as no surprise that um, uh, that these issues uh, would be focused on Israel. And the, and the last last thing I'll say is um, Israel, to I think the regret of any of us who work in the area of international law, is a serial violator of, hum of uh, UN resolutions coming from the Security Council, the top uh, international legislative body uh, in the world. There are over 30 resolutions passed by the Security Council, which includes a permanent veto by the United States uh, that have been critical of Israel with respect to the illegal annexation of East Jerusalem, the um, the illegal uh, uh, 300 settlements in East Jerusalem and the and the West Bank, the illegal placement of the uh, of the wall, um, and uh, a range of human rights violations, uh, and as well as the recognition of the right of Palestinians to self-determination. Israel stands in violation of all of these UN resolutions. Um, and one of the conditions for membership in Article 25 
Now, the Charter of the United Nations is, is that all members will obey and put into force resolutions passed by the Security Council, and Israel is in defiance of that. I, I think Michael has, has excellently answered that, but if I may, can we go back to actually the very first question which was missed, which was Nadia's question, uh, Ange? Uh, yep, that was the next question. Uh, the ne So yeah, from Nadia, uh, Nadia asks, what are your thoughts on university professors who silence and sometimes even negate their students' lived experience as Palestinians on the topic of Palestine, Israel, and the students writing or speaking as part of a discussion? Is there something the student can or should do? Uh, uh, that that's a, a, a fantastic question. Uh, thank you for that, Nadia. And 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 I think I would like to hear to to, to distinguish between different kinds of uh, uh, professors here because some are silencing. That happens uh, one hundred percent. That are actually wanting to silence the Palestinian uh, students or students who want to talk about the Palestinian experience. Uh, there are some who come from a good place of trying to sort of protect the student or they think they're being helpful to the student when they give this kind of advice. Um, uh, um, so, but, but I think that both uh, should be challenged. Um, uh, so, regardless of their intentions, um, uh, um, we should we should not accept this as, as the silence and erasure of Palestinian experiences. Uh, I think students are obviously in a much more vulnerable position. I understand that. Um, uh, uh, then certainly, then tenured professors or, or tenure track professors or anything of the sort. Uh, but but I think they they should try to, to to find if there is a friendly or supportive faculty member in their department or in their faculty that they can reach out to for help. That would be that would be a good first step. Reaching out to their student uh, association, uh, which should offer them some protection, um, and then trying to mobilize as best they can with other like-minded students on campus, um, not just Palestinian and Arab students, but Jewish students, uh, Indigenous students, Black students. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, other other students who are trying to uh, uh, take a, a serious step towards anti-racism and decolonization, uh, try their best to organize with others and mobilize uh, their student power in order to uh, fight back against such silencing and erasure. It, it will be very difficult to do this on your own. Uh, it, it, this can be a very um, marginalizing and, and uh, uh, difficult experience for students. So. Uh, the more you're able, a, better able to mobilize uh, um, and, and, and create collective strength, uh, the better you'll be able to deal with these issues. And I would advise that you not wait for these silence, silences and erasures to happen before you mobilize. Try to mobilize as soon as you can, uh, because these, these experiences will happen, I'm, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say. So, so, so that would be my advice uh, to students, but maybe others have uh, other, other thoughts on that. I think that's great advice. Obviously, Mark, you've had to deal with this your whole academic career. Um, I, I just want to express, uh, I just want to recognize how much, um, uh, how difficult it is, I think, as a, as a Palestinian student, um, as other racialized students in the classroom who, who routinely have their lived experiences of subordination silenced in the classroom. And I think, you know, one, one way of um, dealing with that is also for students and faculty to, um, you know, uh, uh, act and organize and study collectively. I think both racialized faculty and racialized students, and I've worked in, in, in environments where that happens, I think that can be a tremendous source of strength um and uh, uh yeah i just wanted to add add that okay and next question uh yeah the next question is from mara uh, mara asks you've been talking about how your scholarly teaching and research has been interfered with because you do work on israel and palestine academic freedom is supposed to ensure that scholarly work is not obstructed by outside pressure from donors alumni governments or other outside groups what could be done to strengthen that the protection of academic freedom, not only for your work, but for other academics who work on other issues where there are powerful lobby groups? Does anyone want to take that one on? Sorry, I was distracted by looking at the questions. 
<laughs> Can you please so, quickly repeat that or summarize it quickly? Uh, I'll just, I'll repeat the question. Uh, so uh, you've been talking about how your scholarly teaching and research has been interfered with because you do work on Israel and Palestine. Academic freedom is supposed to ensure that scholarly work is not obstructed by outside pressure from donors, alumni, governments, or other outside groups. What could be done to strengthen the protection of academic freedom, not only for your work, but for other academics who work on other issues where there are powerful lobby groups? Yeah, I mean, I would give the same answer that I gave in terms of the students. We've got to mobilize and, and we've got to we, faculty associations and unions are, are the answer because the, the greatest threat to academic freedom is, of course, has always been coming from outside uh, um, governments and uh, corporations and states. Um, our own government, other governments, and 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 powerful industries. Um, you know, here in in, in Calgary, uh, you know, my academic freedom has been uh, sort of uh, violated in terms of the oil industry, uh, oil and gas industry, right? So uh, um, uh, I, I won't get into that story, but um, so I think I think we just need strong mobilization on the faculty level. We we are the only ones that can protect our own freedom. I, I don't have faith. I, I, I grew up under Israeli domination. I don't trust institutions <laughs> um, uh, for good reason. I, I have no illusion about Canadian universities as somehow uh, a safe haven for academic freedom. Um, I, 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 I don't believe that. Uh, so, so it has to be the people who cherish it the most, which is faculty, who are fa especially faculty that are challenging status quo power relations. Um, uh, they're the ones that we have to we have to mobilize and stick together and 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 defend it. Uh, so that would be my answer to that. So could I just break in there for one second? And Michael, what would you think if if associations? I think we have very few grievances over academic freedom, but do you think that they they should be encouraged? That we should be encouraging associations? Grievances, after all, can be made public. They can be, you know, they can be policy grievances. There's interesting, it seems to me there might be interesting things there about persuading um, uh, faculty associations to use their language that they have in their collective agreements and really try to push on some of these violations. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Penny, with, uh, with respect to issues of academic freedom and collective agreements. Collective agreements uh, are the best legal protection, the best legal defense with respect to academic freedom that we have in this country. And they will, but they're only as strong as the willingness of uh, faculty association leadership to be able to use um, the grievance uh, tools uh, to be able to advance these kinds of issues. I, you know, as uh, given the example that I mentioned about an hour ago, uh, I use the grievance uh, uh, procedure to be able to challenge the denial by my dean with respect to having access to be able to, to, uh, to print um, uh, reports uh, on, the, on the Middle East that both benefited my UN work but also benefited my academic work uh, uh, as well. But it may also mean that, and I'm hoping this is one step towards this, that, uh, univers that university faculty association leaderships themselves have to recognize where the threats to academic freedom are coming from. And one of the areas obviously is the constrained discussion on Israel and Palestine. If um, seminars like this reach uh, our faculty membership leadership, um, and allow them to uh, understand uh, the, I guess, the problems faced by scholars who want to speak on Israel and Palestine, that it should be an inherent part both of, both of intramural speech and extramural speech, as well as teaching and research, then I think uh, we've probably, sir, we've gone a long ways to recognizing the full power of the grievance procedure in collective agreements as a tool to try to protect academic freedom on the discussion of Israel and Palestine. Um, I'd like to just come in on that issue. I, I, um, I, I'd want to push back a little bit against the, uh, on the idea that grievances are, I mean, while they can be a very powerful tool, there are, of course, many drawbacks with using that as a way of protecting academic freedom, fighting systemic racism, etc. So one of the drawbacks is that the grievance process is often a very individualized process where the burden is on one person to really shoulder the weight of a grievance. Um, the second uh, you know, problem with, with the 
grievance and the complaints process is that it's happening in an environment, the university environment that is a structurally, a structurally racist environment, right? A structurally sexist environment with all of the intersections, structurally unhelpful, uh, unwell, uh, you know, uh, hostile often to people with various disabilities. So that means that the cost of bringing a grievance for an individual, particularly if they are a racialized person is massive, you know, and um, faculty associations uh, vary enormously in terms of the consciousness of the leadership of the faculty associations or, or their members around these issues. Um, so I, I think that there are, you know, uh, many situations where an individual will bring a grievance and they end up being pathologized. Um, and, um, you know, if, if we're thinking about what systemic racism or gendered racism looks like in the university, it is often to cast that individual as somehow unreasonable, difficult, etc. cetera. Um, you know, many of us get cast into that position, no matter what we do. You know, we're, I'm sure after giving this seminar, this will be seen as a provocation to, you know, or insensitive or uh, problematic in some way. So um, I think that the, you know, the fa faculty associations have to be involved in protecting academic freedom, in advocating for the freedom of scholars to talk, research, uh, uh, Israel Palestine, talk about Israel Palestine to criticize Israel, etc. But I'm not sure. I, I have many more reservations about the grievance procedure for those reasons. If, if I can just uh, comment again, uh, uh, Brina and I may have a difference of, uh, of view on this. I, I think grievance is a powerful weapon. Um, yes, sometimes it means you've got to have an individual step forward and be courageous um, with respect to asking for this. But my experience generally has been is that faculty associations are quite willing uh, to take up and put resources into uh, the promotion of, uh, of, of grievances. And it is in, in comparison to virtually any other means of challenging university decisions or university silence on this issue. Uh, I can't think of a better way of being able to effectively uh, uh, move the art forward then through the grievance process and a collective agreement. Okay, well, we have lots to talk about. <laughs> um, but Ange, perhaps the next question. Yeah, the next question is from Chris. Uh, and Chris says, I'm really interested in the situation in the Middle East. I read a lot of Israeli media. My sense is that there is more tolerance in Israeli media and Israeli universities for discussion of these difficult issues than there is in North American media and universities. Is that the case? Mike, we'll go first. Um, I'll try to answer that very briefly. Um, I think universities in, in, in Israel generally have become much less tolerant of, uh, of critical discussions on Israel and, 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 uh, and Palestine than perhaps would have been the case even 20 years ago. This is part of, I think, of a, of a larger um, right-wing movement um, uh, of public opinion within Israel. We can see the example of that in last week's Israeli uh, elections uh, of the many right-wing and right-of-center uh, MKs that, uh, that were elected. And, and while universities, I think, in Israel, by and large, do allow a larger space for political discussion than you would find in generally in Israeli society, um, there's very little solidarity uh, or empathy or sympathy that I can see by uh, Israeli universities outside of individual scholars with the plight, for example, of academic freedom and its serious infringements that go on for the Palestinian universities in the West Bank uh, and, uh, and in Gaza. Michael nailed it. Nothing to add. <laughs> so we, we just have a few minutes left. Maybe we'll try to fit in a couple of quick questions if we could, Ange. And uh, yep, the next one is from Stepan. Uh, I was one of the authors of the confidential internal internal letter Brenna spoke about expressing concern with the dean's decision not offer uh, not to offer Brenna a position. We have tried for two years to have a frank and constructive conversation within UBC about threats to academic freedom and institutionalized racism exemplified by the dean's decision, hoping that keeping these issues out in the 
out of the public eye might promote a resolution and out of respect for the confidentiality of hiring deliberations. Do you think we were wrong to keep quiet all this time instead of going public? Brenda, I think you should take that first, maybe, or, okay. or is that too? Michael and Mark on this. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. It's difficult. It really is difficult uh, to, to address these questions. My feeling is to go public. Um, um, you know, I, I just think that it's time that we have to shed light on these issues as they as they are under uh, uh, as they are taking place. Um, but I, I'm not I, I'm not here to judge uh, to judge the decisions that were made as wrong. I, I would not say that. Uh, I understand the thinking behind uh, uh, not going public with it at the time. Because, uh, but, but I'm glad that it is coming public now. Uh, so, so as long as it goes public at some point, I suppose is a great thing. And and you also have to respect the wishes of the faculty member involved. I hear so many stories, a, a lot of stories. People come to me with a lot of them, especially Palestinian Canadian stories, and they want me to keep quiet. And I absolutely respect that, and I will always honor that. Um, and I understand the reasoning behind that. But but I think. Even if we do think at the time it has to stay uh, quiet for for the sake of this person and, and their career and and cementing their career in that place, uh, 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 that's that's fine and that's great. Uh, but let's at one point uh, come out uh, publicly with it because you you have to shine a light on this issue. The only way that we can defeat fear is through collective action, and and that means a, a collective telling of our of our stories. Uh, so, so that would be my, my thoughts on that. I'll just be brief. I'll say, I guess my, the answer, the question I would ask always in these sorts of questions is what's, what's going to promote a just uh, resolution with respect to this? Sometimes it is quiet. I mean, I'm, as a labor lawyer, I do lots and lots of mediation and uh, generally uh, settlements sometimes are, wind up being confidential, but people walk away happy. So I can, I can see the sense in certain circumstances of wanting to keep uh, this confidential, quiet, um, below the radar. Um, but in, and that has promoted a just resolution. I can see in other examples that that's not going to promote uh, a just resolution, uh, or the, the quiet route didn't work, and therefore going public is is the only way. Sometimes it costs, and people uh, would often have fear the cost, but sometimes that cost may be worth it uh, as um, as the risk you take in order to try to achieve a just result. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, that. Um... There, you know, in Sarah Ahmed's book, Complaint, she details through really thorough ethnographies how confidentiality is used by institutions and, and also by our colleagues to um, shut down discussion of these precise issues. And, you know, we, we've obviously gone public now, <laughs> and, and that's after nearly two years. I joined the faculty nearly two years ago and had my interview th nearly three years ago. And that's after so many good faith attempts to deal with these issues in a considered, deliberate uh, um, manner that have not gone anywhere. Um, and so we need to, yes, uh, air these issues openly and talk about them together. Thank you. I think we have really run out of time. I'm going to call on Jim Turk again to come back in. And um, I want to say my own word of thanks to the panelists for a really rich discussion. Thank you. I too want to thank uh, you, Penny, and, I, and especially the panelists for this discussion. I mean, you've had to deal with really difficult issues about Israel and Palestine, but also more generally about academic freedom. And I think you've raised a lot of things that we will continue in our series. Uh, uh, so I, I want to thank you very much. And I also want to thank the audience uh, for joining this conversation and for the good questions that uh, you asked. Um, the next event, uh, I'm sorry, before I, before I talk about the next event, uh, a video of today's panel will be posted on the Center for Free Expression website tomorrow. And that website address is cfe.torontomu.ca. And so if you have any colleagues who you think might like to see this, uh, uh, it will be on our website. In addition, on our website will be a number of readings and other resources 
YouTube videos and so forth related to the issues we talked about today uh, for those who want to dig deeper into some of the things that the panel was discussing today. So that'll be on our website, cfe.torontomu.ca. Our next panel, which is going to be the next in this series on threats to academic freedom, is going to be two weeks uh, in two weeks. It's going to be on Wednesday, November 30th. And it's going to be asking the same sorts of questions, but with regard to the study of India. Since the 2014 election of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the BJP government, scholars of India's history, politics, and culture have been challenged as anti-national, hostile to the dominant religion, ethnicity, and culture, and subjected to abuse, threats, violence in Canada and in the United States and in India and in Europe, including threats against members of their family in India where they're scholars in North America, if they have family in India. So we're gonna explore what this means for scholars and their work and what can be done to protect academic freedom so that whether somebody is studying Israel or Palestine or India or uh, popular, raising questions about popular things in North America, uh, that their work is not interfered with by pr outside pressures or inside pressures, because the pressures can come from inside as well as outside and be very effective in suppressing uh, the serious inquiry into difficult issues. So again, thank you to the panel and thank you to the audience. Visit uh, videos of all of our past events, uh, as well as uh, uh, notices of our upcoming events are on our, our website, as are our blog and resource materials on the many aspects of expressive freedom and the public's right to know. We thank you so much for joining us today and hope you'll join us again. Bye-bye.